Hello viewers, Alan here. Welcome back to my workshop. Uh, haven't been in here much just lately. Had some time off uh, for a holiday with the family and various other things, but back into it now. Um, so this video is about uh, my first foray into 3D printing. I've been interested in the idea for a while, but not done anything about it. While I was away on holiday, I came across a tripod, which was in an op shop, cheap, because a critical element, this uh, plastic knuckle, was broken. And I thought, well, that's an ideal candidate for a first foray into um, 3D printing. So um, I don't have a 3D printer, but I have a friend who does. So this video is actually a collaboration with him, and you'll be meeting him in a little while. And so the content of the thing is um, uh, modelling it in, uh, in a CAD product, which was also new to me. Then having a look at the 3D printing side of it, and then I also wanted to make one in aluminium uh, for comparison. So I've got a plastic one, a printed one, and an aluminium one. Um, the CAD stuff was quite a learning curve, and it took me several days to get to the point where I could actually do something useful and uh, produce a model for this thing. Uh, the aluminium part was also a bit of a challenge uh, because there were quite a few operations and working out the, the holding for it was, uh, was interesting. Anyway, so the video is fairly long, I'm afraid. It's, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes or something. So uh, better get into it. Okay, so having a close look at this piece, see how it's supposed to be with that uh, through there. And there's a pocket here for the nut, because obviously you don't want that screwing into plastic, it wouldn't last very long. So those are the key bits, and um, it's uh, intended to fit around that uh, stub. So, um, oh, let's have a quick look at the size of this beast. We can see it's about 45 or so long, probably about 25 that way, so it's quite a small piece. Looking more closely at the, the piece, We can see there are a number of features um, in two types. There's features that are there for um, uh, touch and feel and appearance. And then there are some which are really important dimensionally and positionally. So this hole has to be accurately made to a size. And this piece has to be a, a, a reasonable thickness. This piece also has to be to a, dementor, a diameter. And then there's a, a curved bottom groove, which you can see there, and a, another thread get passes through there. So the relationship between that groove and this is important, and of course there's the screw hole going down through there. So there are those uh, structural features, and uh, otherwise we've got a whole lot of ornamental type things, the curves and things that make it a nice... Um, uh, safe and pleasant to, to handle uh, but uh, there's quite a lot of discretion about how to actually uh, deal with that okay so this is intended to be intended to be very much an overview of the process I went through there are lots of online tutorials that you can find for this product which will show you all the details this is going to be about 10 minutes and just a, quite an overview of this, the steps in the process to give you a bit of a look and a feel so I've just uh, opened the product and clicked on new to create a new model. This is how it comes up. So we'll start off with part design and we need a, uh, a body and then we'll do a sketch within that. We'll be in the XY plane. So this is our basic drawing board. Now if you visualize the item we're trying to make as having um, two separate areas above and below the equator, the piece above is the clamping block, shall we say. The piece below is the pivot block. So we'll start off by modelling the, the clamping block. So to do that, I'm going to start with a, a circle. And we'll set the diameter of the or radius of the circle at 12.7 uh, for 25.4 diameter. Uh, get a couple of lines on here. And uh, anchor the ends of the lines on the circle. Like that. <coughs> I'd like these two lines to stay parallel to each other and for the two of them to be 
13.5 apart. So now I can make these two lines equal. And uh, I've got a fully constrained sketch. So all of the items you can see in the sketch now are defined to the product. It says fully constrained there. Now, um, the basic shape I want is what's banded by these four points. I don't want these bits here and here. There is a way to delete them, I believe, but I don't know what it is. So what I'm going to do is delete the circle and recreate the curved elements like this. That's one. We'll set the radius on that to be 12.7. Yep. And then um, we'll do another one over here. And uh, make these two pieces equal. So that's the basic shape that I want of a wire frame. Um, and it says fully constrained, good to go. So we close that. And it's always a good idea to save frequently. So now what we're going to do is a process called extrusion. So we click on this tool and we want to make this piece um, 15 millimeters high. So that's the, uh, we'll rename this as the um, clamp block lower. So now we want to build a, a top piece on, on that. So we want to build on that face. New sketch. And to access the um, bit that we've already done, we use a thing called external geometry, which will bring features from the previous bit. Uh, forward so that we can access them and um, we're going to put some a couple of points on here like that we're going to mirror this curve Confirm that the radius for that is 12.7 with the constraint. Then we're going to put, uh, we want to anchor this point as at the halfway mark. So uh, I think we need to do that. So we'll do from there to there and from there to there. And to make sure this piece is the, in the middle, we use a there's, I'm sure a lot of different ways to do this, but what I'm going to do is put a bit of construction geometry, which is in, in the model, but won't appear in the final result. So now that lets me make that line, that line, equal length. That guarantees that this point is in the middle. And I want this line and this line to be the same length. Now I need a line to join here. missed something there. Oh, I'm still in construction geometry, am I? Okay. I would delete that line, get out of construction geometry, and do a real line. Right. Now, um, there's something's partially redundant. Don't know what that is. Let's just get rid of it. So now we're fully constrained with no redundancy. And you can see the, what, the, what this wireframe looks like. So we'll get out of there. And now I want to rotate or revolve this around on top of that. So we'll click on the revolve tool. And we only actually want to go 180 degrees. And so there is the, uh, the, 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 the shape of our um, top piece. So we'll rename this clamp block 
and now's a good time to save so because this is only intended to be a look and feel uh, not a detailed how to I'm going to start jumping ahead so we've done this uh, clamping block got that so next thing to do is the what I've called the screw boss we can see what that looks like so that's a piece that's going to extend up from the bottom and while we do that is to put the circle and do the extrusion up um, then I want you to get a hole through it of course up through the middle same deal um, another hole or it's another circle and uh, extrude it up through the middle so that gives us the uh, the basic shape moving on want to get to um, a cutout for the nut to go in um, so same deal um, if we go to the sketch mark out a rectangle to extrude upwards to create that uh, cutout as you can see next thing was to get um, the big hole through the middle uh, for the clamping hole so that's the end result of that achieved by a very simple uh, marking out a circle and punching it through and then I needed to do the um, piece on the bottom uh, the what I called the pivot boss so that was another revolution so if we dive in and have a look I put a, a wire frame underneath that lot and uh, all of this lot was designed in the XY plane but this was done in the YZ plane because I had to rotate it around a different axis so fully dimensioned as um, as you see oops when we do the uh, the rotation you get the whole thing so really it doesn't take very much to to get these things happening now I'm going to stop the uh, design process there for this video there's a little bit more to do tidying up that little bit and chamfering the corners and whatnot but that's basically it so then the thing would be to um, export that we do that with uh, exporting oh. <laughs> when you collect when you uh, highlight it export the thing to uh, an STL file and I've already done that so it's sitting there but we can go and have a look at that so we can inspect the uh, STL by double clicking on it and it'll open it with FreeCAD and uh, that's what I handed off to my friend Mark to, uh, to print for me okay so um, we've reached the point where I've um, finished the digital design produced the STL file and I uh, want to handball it to my friend Mark who will introduce himself in a second we, we actually worked together for some years and we've been mates for a while too so it's just a bit of backstory anyway um, I uh, had quite a learning curve with the 3D CAD stuff and uh, I didn't feel like another learning curve with the printing Mark's got the experience and I thought I'd draw on that so um, introduce yourself Mark Hello everyone, my name's Mark. Uh, I'm only relatively new to the whole um, 3D printing world. I've certainly got some young guys that I work with that are absolute supreme experts at it, so I don't profess to be an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I've learnt enough out of this um, experience to be able to be of some assistance to Alan to merge the 3D printing uh, element into th uh, this particular project. But the area which we think might be worth homing in on is how we actually get from the digital um, picture, the STL file, which in some respects is a logical design because it's not expressed in a way specific to any particular printer. And so now the experience and knowledge that Mark's brought to the table is to get from that to working with his specific printer and getting the result. 
Okay, so there's a few basic uh, concepts that we need to get our head around when we start looking at using 3D printers. Um, one of the things that um, we need to deal with is preparing the printer. Um, and preparing the printer in, uh, involves certain elements like um, making sure that the print bed that you're using is clean, making sure that it's absolutely level, that's absolutely critical because when we're printing with a 3D printer, we're printing at uh, resolution levels as low as 0.12 of a millimetre for each particular layer. So across the print bed, if the uh, calibration is not quite right, it can mean that the object that you're printing ends up as a bit of a disaster. Most prints that, uh, that we tend to do are usually done at a resolution of 0.2 of a millimetre, so five passes or five layers to, to a millimetre. Um, one of the other things that's quite um, great about 3D printing is that you can actually use a variety of different filaments. Um, some of the filaments are quite difficult to use because they have some quite um, unusual idiosyncrasies around temperature um, and things like that. The most common form of uh, pr printing that we use is uh, using a filament which is called PLA plus and just, that's the I'll most just, common. Just jump in there for a second mate. So, so how would you contrast the, I mean just going back to the reason for this project, I had a plastic piece that broke. So um, do you think this PLA stuff would be equal to or stronger than the original? It, um, yes I believe it would be. Uh, if we're trying to do something that needs a bit more resilience um, we might try and print it in ABS. Uh, but ABS um, is, to be honest, I haven't had a huge amount of success printing in ABS because uh, it, um, it, it's it got, as I say, a few idiosyncrasies, okay. particularly around temperature. And if I actually look to the experts that I uh, work with that, that play with this sort of thing all their time in the spare time, predominantly they print in PLA+, plus for, uh, and they've created some massive objects out of their 3D printing uh, exposés to, um, to to give them what they want and they've done it quite satisfactorily with okay. PLA+. Plus. Um, so one of the things that um, we once we've determined what particular filament we're going to use and we've actually set our printer up um, and made sure it's clean and all those sorts of things, probably the most critical uh, step in the process is that when you commence with an STL file, which Alan mentioned earlier, is the output file from the CAD program that he created, that creates effectively the 3D object. That file needs to be massaged into a language that gives the printer every absolute command that it needs to be able to print that file. So for example, um, it needs to know that it prints a certain amount of uh, length along a particular dimension at a particular layer um, and then it goes off somewhere else and prints something else before it goes to the next layer. It also includes elements such as uh, the temperature that you're going to be printing at, the speed that you're going to be printing at and another very important factor is uh, what is called support. Now I like, to cook, can, I like to call support a little bit like scaffolding. Bear in mind that when a 3D printer starts printing, it, it starts from the base layer and builds upwards. So if you're trying to print an object which has got nothing below it um, and until it gets up, say, three or four millimetres in the air, and it then starts to print a horizontal plane, it can't actually print that but if there's nothing underneath it to support the molten uh, PLA resin that's actually going to come out. Yeah, that, that's such an obvious point. And yet I have to admit my ignorance. When I started doing this logical design, it's not something I thought about. So there's a big hole through the middle of this thing, and I didn't really give any thought to, well, how's that going to work? Because mm -hmm. there's nothing underneath mm -hmm. it. So what happens then is that the uh, you, you command the printer to build a support layer underneath it, a scaffolding layer. And the scaffolding layer certainly doesn't need to be the density of what it is that you're trying to print. 
For example, if you decide that you're going to print an object at 100%, and I'll explain that further in a minute, these articles that we've printed for Al and I have done these at 100%. Underneath it, when it builds the support layer, it might actually build it as if you like a, um, a hexagonal cross hatching or lines or those sorts of things. A bit, bit of a honeycomb. A bit, yeah, honeycomb type shape is another one. Uh, in the printer software, there's uh, a, a, an ability to choose, I think it's about 15 or 20 different structures. Um, but basically what happens is that support layer gets built so that it, it has enough strength and enough spacing with it to be able to actually print a layer when you get to the layer of the actual object um, in a continuous form. So for example, if you were trying to actually create something with a support layer that was say 10 millimeters spaced apart, then when you try to print something in air, it, it, it's not going to be able to do that because it will have sag. So your spacing for your support structure tends to be smaller. This is all sacrificial, of course, because when the object is finished, you basically break that component off. You have to give some consideration to the way that you're going to orientate this object, um, depending on uh, how you're going to be able to break away the elements. And I've got two examples here. This particular one here, uh, I have printed this from the side uh, up. So if we imagine that that's the article that Alan has been trying to print, I've printed it such that it starts building from one side. And if I separate the pieces, you'll see a square cross-hatching pattern, if you can make that out, uh, which actually shows the support structure underneath it. And then when it gets to the point where it knows it needs to print the object, it then starts printing a solid. The um, consequence of that is that sometimes when you actually print an object with the support structure, Sometimes it means that the, um, the, the cleanliness or the smoothness, for want of a better word, in a particular dimension might not be quite right um, to your liking. So if I look at this particular item here, this is one where I printed it vertically. Far better looking item than this particular one here. They both serve the purpose um, and that you can mitigate to some degree um, some of the issues with the way that the, the cleanliness of the print by um, doing some post-production filing and things like that. But this particular item here, which is straight off the printer, this is by far a better piece. I suppose one thing that's, that's, that's probably a key takeaway from all of this, though, is that um, the speed to actually get an item like this out. I've had a few instances where I've made components for friends, uh, this one being one of them where the file literally has been emailed to me um, you know, late in the evening or in, sometime during the day, and a couple of hours later, the object's been printed, and there you go, there's your object. Hmm. Um, it might not be necessarily to the quality of what you might be able to produce out of a, having a very good lathe and mill, but not everyone's got that capability. And if you actually look at the cost that a lot of 3D printers have come down to now, it's incredibly cheap for the quality output that you can get out of it. Um, so that is a, that is a, a, a big win. There's, there's 3D printing has, has uh, infiltrated so many different industries these days um, for prototyping and in, actually, in actual fact making a lot of production parts. Even the first piece that Mark made for me, because uh, when I first did the design, I wasn't sure, of course, whether it would work or it wouldn't. So he printed it in draft mode, and in draft mode, the piece was actually pretty much hollow. It was just an outer skin to proof of concept and dimensions and such. But I actually took that away with me. I had a week's holiday down at Victor Harbour, and I took it away with me, and we used it for a week, and it worked. And it was actually only when I got back, and ironically, I pulled the tripod apart to try the aluminium one out, and I <laughs> broke it. When I was pulling it apart, and then I could see that it was actually hollow. These latest parts I've actually made for Alan uh, at a hundred percent density, but it's quite common in three D printing that people produce 
parts that are actually hollow and they use one of the things you can specify in the software is what's called the infill density and the infill density that's quite commonly chosen is 20 percent so uh, um, you know I can think of some items that have been produced at a place where I work which are quite large um, if they were actually made as a hundred percent solid piece they would consume kilograms of uh, PLA resin and take uh, weeks to print. Whereas uh, when you're producing something that might be more of a visual uh, item or even something that need, that still has um, some strength requirements, it's quite amazing what you can actually build out of something that's uh, only got a 20% infill density with the appropriate internal support structure. All right, well look, in the interest of trying to keep this video to a, a, a relatively short uh, time frame, or acceptable time frame, I think we better call it there, Mark. This is clearly a huge topic. And I started out with what I didn't know would have filled all of the books on 3D printing. I feel like I've come along a, a little way. I'm, I wouldn't say I've come very far with uh, my knowledge, but a little bit. Thanks very much to Mark's patience and his support. So, no worries. Yeah. Now maybe we'll come up with some more collaboration projects. Yes, I'm sure we will. Yep. Okay, so now I've got to move on to the rest of this uh, project, which is to make the uh, piece in aluminium and uh, using conventional machining. So sort of lathe work, mill work, dividing head, etc, etc. So let's get into that and see uh, how that all worked out. So, um, starting on the aluminium piece, uh, begin obviously by uh, cleaning up the piece of aluminium bar stock. So I'm going to face it off and uh, turn to uh, the OD. But the inserts I'm using to do this were I was put onto them by Matty of Matty's Workshop, and they're TNGG 1604, and the uh, the 0.4 uh, millimeter nose radius uh, and and the cutting edge geometry just do a really superb job of putting a fine finish on. Not really suitable for heavy cuts, but um, I'm talking about a, a one millimeter uh, off the diameter here, and uh, it just leaves a superb finish. And they seem to work equally well on, on um, steel and these these softer materials, so I'm very happy with them. They also have six cutting edges um, on each insert, so they actually turn out to be fairly economical. Right, well, I was shooting for 15.8. Let's see what we got. Hmm. Just testing the fit here. Yeah, I reckon that'll be pretty good. So I had to grind a profile cutter to do the 5.5 um, wide groove. So I'm using my uh, <laughs> grinder accessory made from a wheel cylinder here. And it works pretty well. <laughs> to give myself a line to grind to, I clamped a washer with a 5.5mm hole in it on top of the tool blank and I can scribe around that now and that should get me close enough I would think I don't have to go all the way to the line, but it gives me something to aim at. Right, so I finished making the form tool and ready to start here. This OD is 15.8 and I've got a 2mm parting blade here. So I'll plunge that in to reduce the diameter at the bottom of the groove to probably 11mm and then come back out and do a cut each side, a little somewhat less. And then uh, hopefully the um, form tool will be able to do the rest.
start having a go with the form tool and see how that works out. It's not happy. Better check that it's on centre. And it looks pretty good. So I'd say I haven't got enough uh, front clearance. Going to adjust the tool. Okay, so I've got the uh, tool reground with more front rake. I might just check the uh, uh, centre height again. That still looks alright. See if we do any better this time. Okay, so I think we're ready for a test fit. Um, there's a bit of scope obviously because it's a split thing, but it'd be nice if it's a close fit. That's pretty good. Make sure this bolt thing lines up in the in that groove feature. That seems to work all right. This is only a lightweight tripod. I mean, I'm sure I could wrench that round, but I'm sure that's got enough grip to uh, get the job done. All right, so now I've got that sorted. I want to make the next part of it, which is this bit from, from here to here. So that's got to come down to 25.4 for eight millimeters, allowing for a one millimeter chamfer here. Uh, 25.4 I was shooting for. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that. I guess that finishes the easy bit. <laughs> uh, part it off and get started on this uh, upper end, which will be a bit more challenging, I think. Down to two millimeters left now. I think I'll cut that off with a hexel. There we go. So I've put that back in the chuck the other way around so I can face this end off and I just thought I'd just check the run out. I don't know if you'll be able to see that but it um, looks like the run out's about a 0 .01, 0 0.01 of a millimetre. So half a thou or something. It's pretty good for a three drawer chuck. Okay let's face that end off. To the milling machine for the rest of this. Okay so I'm getting ready to put uh, these uh, flats on my aluminium piece and just explaining the setup. I've got the small end of this thing in an ER40 collet which is probably got a reasonably substantial grip on it but um, because it's cantilevered out a little bit I've put some uh, 
stoppage or scaffolding or something uh, to uh, hold against the back face and also to stop it from being pushed down. This thing's just an adjustable um, parallel. And I'm going to do going to take three nine millimeter wide passes. I think two millimeters deep would be fine, but I'll go one millimeter to start with um, for a total depth of 7.72, I believe. Yes. All right, so let's get started. It's making quite a mess. Let's see if we can uh, do without it. So I flipped it over and now we'll do the other side. So now I need an 18 millimeter hole um, perpendicular to these faces, and um, I've done. This is an 18 millimeter annular cutter, and I've checked them out before. They cut a hole pretty darn close to size, and in this situation, it's going to be slotted with a clamping screw. It'll be good enough, and it's uh, quicker than um, using a boring tool. And I just don't need that accuracy. So we'll get on and do that. But one thing I think we do need, which I forgot to put in, is a a prop underneath here. Probably don't need it, but I'm not going to take the chance. But as you can see, we're through. Right, let's pull it all apart, clean everything up and see what we've got. All right, so we've got a nice clean hole, and this uh, starts to look at it, uh, and I think by the time the split's gone in there, we'll be fine. So I'm set up now for drilling the uh, hole for the uh, clamping screw, and in this configuration now, as I've got it uh, set, I've got to drill vertically down. But um, it dawned on me that I wasn't actually wise to do this big hole first because the vertical hole that I'm going to do here will break out into that. So to minimise the risk of things going wrong there I've knocked up this uh, plug which should be a fairly close fit in there. Perhaps it's too close. it um, fetching up against that toe I think yeah so that'll be fine it's probably a good thing that it's a really firm fit because now when the drill breaks through it won't try and rotate that and jam itself so I think that's probably good okay so let's get set up to do this drilling now the plastic piece being plastic has got a pocket in it uh, it's not very easy to see here and a nut is put into the pocket so the screw coming in from the top here engages in, in that nut but aluminium's slightly sterner stuff than this, so I'm going to try not bothering with the pocket. I guess I can always come back afterwards. So the plan is to uh, drill a hole down here. Um, first part of the hole is a clearance diameter for um, a 5mm tap. And the second part of the hole will be the um, tapping size for that, which is 4.2. So off we go. I think that'll be it. But that'll be deep enough to get past the halfway point. 
So now I can do the uh, bottom half of this hole, which will be for the tapping, uh, for the tap thread. Uh, it's just, I can see it's just touching the top of the hole there. So that's it. Well anyway, that's most of the work done, so I can put a 4.2mm twist drill in there now. Okay, so I cut the thread and it's just dawned on me that I might be wasting my time doing this um, because uh, quite a bit of the thread below the centre line is going to be blocked out by this hole through the other side here. So <laughs> I might finish up having to put a pocket and a nut in the bottom anyway. Well, we'll carry on, see how we go. This is the screw that's going to have to go into it. Alright. Well, I guess it's time to uh, push this out. Okay, well that uh, piece pressed out quite easy, just to use the vise and a bit of a push and it was out. So I don't know how well you can see that, but we've certainly got a thread down the bottom of the hole there. And this seems to be quite happy to uh, find its way in there. So that uh, that's actually got a reasonable thread engagement at the bottom there, so I think that might actually work out alright. So that's that bit done. So next thing I think is to um, thin out the back here. So I'd like to um, radius like that but on a, a smaller radius so bring it down to the um, to the radius of this section here. So I think the way I'm going to do that I mean, this is, we're getting now into things to make it look nice, and they're not functional. It does need to be thinned off on the back here, but I could do it with just some 45s and whatever. But uh, I think I'll mount this in, because I've got it and I can do it, um, I'll mount this in the um, dividing head and uh, rotary table, I guess is better, for, and uh, then I'll be able to uh, turn this around under an end mill. So let's go and uh, get set up for that. Okay, so I've got the uh, piece set up in the rotary table and um, there's a quite a bit of stick out which I'm not comfortable with so I just started off with a, a very light cut just to find my way and convince myself it's going to be alright. So a depth of cut's a millimetre and the feed was two millimetres. So we'll gingerly step through that and see if we can bring this down to that uh, smaller diameter there. Getting a very good finish, that's for sure. I'm not actually sure why that is either. But I suppose it will clean up afterwards with a bit of sandpaper or something. Let's make sure I haven't got too close. Now that seems to be alright. We come down for what I think will be nearly the finishing cut, we'll see. Another millimetre anyway.
sure what caused those ridges. So I just gave it a quick uh, rub with some uh, 180 grit, I think it is, uh, paper. And even that um, has got it looking uh, pretty reasonable. So I'll be able to improve on that. It's certainly uh, going to be good enough. It's the key thing is to reduce the thickness here so that when I do the slot here there's going to be enough give here for this to uh, close up. I don't know how much difference it would make losing this corner to that. Presumably that would help as well so that's why I've got to decide what I can easily achieve here. So I've come up with a strategy for rounding that corner. What I'm going to do is uh, slice this through here uh, which I needed to do anyway and then I'll be able to mount it on this stub which I had before and uh, put that in there and uh, rotate it around using that and that will allow me to do that uh, round that corner off. Well, that's the plan, let's see how it goes. Right, pull it all apart, mount it on this in there and bring it back. Alright, we're set up to go now. Um, we've got this on there. I'm going to try taking um, half a millimetre depth of cut with each, uh, each uh, rotation. We'll see how that goes. Seemed to work all right. Now it'd be nice if I could get some sort of a chamfer on that corner. Let's uh, see what's in the toolkit. So I've put a small chamfering bit in and I haven't tried to do anything like this before so I'm not sure quite how it's going to work out but uh, I'll try with a two millimeter depth of cut and see if we can get a bit of a chamfer on this corner. Uh, let's see what happens. I'm going to go a bit faster, I think. get oh that's not too bad I think that's about done it for that side so we're going to turn this off and turn it over and uh, try and do the same thing on the other side all right so it's set up to do the other side I've got it all in reverse but I have to start here so I have to plunge in two millimeters Alright, well, that seemed to work out alright. At least it looks the same as the other side, which is the best I could hope for, I think. Right, well, that seemed to work out pretty well, so I'm going to see if I can get a 1mm chamfer on these other corners. Right, 
so that was the broken piece that we wanted to make a replacement for. So making it from aluminium, that was my uh, end result. Um, I didn't try to make it exactly the same. That's pretty close, I guess. Um, anyway, more importantly perhaps, is to see whether it works. I just uh, gave it a bit of a polish with some memory paper. So, let's see if it uh, will get the job done. So this bit's got to fit over that. It's a fairly firm fit, deliberately so. Right, so on there. And uh, that's the clamp screw for that piece. That's all good. And then this piece, uh, where does that go? Go like that. Yeah, I think, yeah, it goes like that. Alright, so that goes on there. With that going in through, so we drifted out of the picture. That going in there. And Bob's your mother's brother. So I think that's uh, all fine and dandy. It'll certainly uh, be a lot stronger than the original piece anyway. Right, so that's the aluminium bit done. Okay, so I've finished my project. Uh, you've seen the tripod already with the aluminium piece in. And it's sitting here with one of my cameras on it with the, the plastic piece in. So what did I learn? Um, CAD software, at least the package I used, when you first start with it, is a bit intimidating. It's a very feature-rich uh, package and it takes uh, quite a bit to come to grips with it. But thankfully there's a lot of useful um, tutorial stuff on the internet, so it wasn't that bad really. And once uh, I've got the basic skills, I'm really confident that I can do most things with it. So that I got there surprisingly quickly, so that was good. Armed with that uh, capability, um, and access to a 3D printer, uh, I reckon I can do a lot of stuff now, which I was not able to do before. As to the 3D printing itself, I was a bit surprised, pleasantly surprised, at how strong the, the pieces are, and how easy it is to print to a fairly exact dimension. Uh, and the, the piece price, once you've um, got the design and the printer, the piece price of using the, um, the, the, whatever the stuff's called, the, uh, the, uh, the consumable, I can't remember what it's called. Um, the, the price for the consumable is actually very low. Um, making it in aluminium is certainly going to be a, a much stronger result, but there was a lot, of, a lot of hours went into that. It was surprising how long it took. And of course, uh, you've got to have a lot of expensive machinery to be able to do it. Whereas with the 3D printing, um, $400 Australian will get you started with a pretty good sort of a printer capable of doing that. So um, my attitude towards 3D printing has changed quite a bit. And instead of it being a, um, a bit of a fringe dweller in my consciousness, I now will see it as uh, front and center as a, a solution candidate for, well, repairing uh, broken equipment where uh, plastic pieces have to be made. And just uh, one other example I made, oh, I'm, I'll go and get it and show you. So some time ago, I made a, a, a rack for ER40 collets, and I made it out of a slab of plastic, which is a fairly expensive piece to buy. And it's obviously got lots of holes in it. And each one of these holes is actually about three different, uh, done with about three different diameters, because it wasn't easy to get a taper in the hole. So it took quite a while to make it. It's sitting on six separate feet, which are screw fixed to the underside. So there are a number of uh, pieces in the solution. Well, with what I now know about 3D printing, it'll be a no-brainer to do this with a 3D print. I use this PLA, PLA material, I remember what it's called finally, um, and this would be a prime candidate for an infill density of only 20%, which is what Mark said was fairly common uh, in, in use. So, faced with similar challenges to this in the future, my go-to is going to be 3D printing as long as Mark's prepared to let me have access to his machine. 
Um, anyway, the uh, the video was done in th three uh, major parts, and the skill levels evident in them were quite different. So with the the CAD stuff, I was really didn't know what I was doing at, f at first, but the aluminium machining, well, I've got a lot more experience in that field. So um, it's likely that the video didn't appeal uniformly to all <laughs> throughout. But in any case, if you stuck with it, thanks for watching. I hope you did enjoy it and got something from it. And in any case, I look forward to seeing you on the next one.